Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Green and Molnar show here on Newcastle Fans TV. Today, myself and Sam Molnar are joined by the former Newcastle United editor in the Evening Chronicle. And there's now the current Northern football correspondent of the eye. It's a big welcome to Mark Douglas. Mark, welcome to the show. Uh, good to be here, guys. Good to be here. Glad we finally uh, finally got it sorted. It feels like I've been promising to come on for about six months, I think. But uh, But yeah, it's good to be on here. Probably the best time to come on with all this positivity coming around as well. But uh, just just for a little summary, you've been covering for Newcastle for more than a decade. Mm. Um, what, when you were given the opportunity to cover Newcastle United, why did you say yes? <laughs> well, it, it was funny. I was um, I was covering Wolverhampton Wanderers for the Express and Star, which is the, the local paper there. My um, neck of the woods. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, look, it, it, and a fantastic job it was, and I, I, I love doing Wolves, but. I got the chance to kind of come up and, and do Newcastle. I remember my chief sports writer at the time saying, look, you, you know, it's this mad up there, like crazy in terms of like there's so many stories, but you'll get loads of trips to Europe. You know, you'll have great time up there. As it turned out in the 10 years in between then and now, I think Wolves have been in Europe three times. Newcastle have done done one trip. I think they've done one, uh, you know, the, the, the Europa League a few years ago. So, yeah, there was a little bit of that. And I think, I think, I think even when it came in, it was, it was 2000. I think 2008, I think 2007 it was. So it was early, Ashley, but you kind of, the, the way it was at the end with Ashley, it felt like by the end that was all Ashley was. But at 2007, 2008, I, I remember like there were still people sat on the fence with him. Uh, and of course, when they did finish fifth, that was a, that was a good year. You know, that was, that was a pretty good year. If they have that same year next year, we'll all be kind of like, we'll all be absolutely, um, you know, absolutely ecstatic. So, it felt like, I mean, and look, you know, it's still one of the biggest clubs in the country. You know, it doesn't, you know, I now cover like a lot of other, a lot of other clubs as well. And obviously like Newcastle's still the one that I kind of know the best and it will be for, you know, I think for as long as I'm doing this job. But, uh, you know, no matter how big those clubs are, it feels like Newcastle is the one with, you know, I think, I think some of those clubs have massive international fan bases, but the international fan base is slightly different. The international fan base that Newcastle's got, the international fan base that like kind of Liverpool, Manchester United have got, it's probably kind of grown a little bit differently because if you're an international fan base and you follow Newcastle, you're not in it because they win games. You know, they win games all the time. They probably will be in a few years' time, hopefully. Um, so, so you know, Newcastle still feels like a really big club, and obviously the Chronicle's a, a great newspaper as well to be part of. So, I don't regret it, but I'll tell you, it felt pretty strained at times, and I think probably this time last last year was amongst the lowest I felt covering Newcastle because just there was no new narratives. We, we you know. Steve Bruce hated the local papers. We we didn't, you know, I don't think there was much love lost there either way. It felt like, you know, everybody was just prepared for what was going to happen until October. And it, it was it was really like it was grim by the end. But it wasn't like that at the start, you know, and it did feel like it was a it was a great club to cover um for the Chronicle. You know, I just wish I'd probably have what the, the next five years are going to be like. I think that would be that'd be great, that'd be great fun to cover. And I'm really glad I still get to cover it. Um, but I think the Chronicle are going to have a lot of fun with that as well. So, um, so yeah. But good luck to them. I had, you know, I, I think I've done, I've done my stint. I think I've done my stint by the end. So, what, what is it that made you kind of stick with reporting on Newcastle for so long? Because, as you say, it was, it was a all in all a horrendous time. And like most other, some of the journo's in the area, are, are, you know, boyhood Newcastle fans. But you, you're, you're Bradford City. So. Why were you not writing odes to Benito Carbone <laughs> and like David Weatherall? Well, I mean, you know, I think, well, I do have a Newcastle connection. I was actually born uh, around here. So it was kind of like, you know, I do have a little bit of a connection to uh, to, to the region. Um, but, I, you know, it's a weird thing. Like for Newcastle United gets under your skin, you know, and I, and I think like I've got two kids now. I've got um, both, you know, both young and like my, my little boy, he's only four years old. I bought him a Bradford kit, but I have a feeling he's going to be round here. You know, he's going to end up being a Newcastle fan. So I think, unfortunately, it's like one of those things where you marry into a family that's kind of, you know, it feels a bit like now I'm going to be kind of, you know, I've got an emotional attachment to it as well. And it does get under your skin, you know, because you kind of like, Newcastle United is not, it, it, it's a club, but it's also a sort of, it's an identity in, in Newcastle. And I think, by the end, you know, there was a reason why a lot of us, even the ones who weren't from Newcastle, felt such euphoria at the takeover, even though there was, you know, legitimate questions about the, the kind of, you know, the provenance of the money and all those kind of things. But there was, you got carried away with it because it, you, you could see what this football club means to people in the area. And I think 
part of me, I, I, I stuck around a lot of it because I, I wanted to see what's going to happen in the next few years. You know, I, 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 I was just like, you know, what this what the season was like at the end of last season. I, I can't imagine what it's going to be like if Newcastle win something or get close to winning something. You know, bear in mind, I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen them get to a, a you know, I think quarterfinal was the furthest they've been in any competition in the, the 13 years that I've been up here. I can't imagine what it would be like if they got to a semi-final or, you know, God forbid, a final, you know, League Cup or FA Cup final, you know, or, or got to the point where they were actually going to try and win something. It would just be incredible. I think that's part of the motivation for staying around here. And I really enjoyed the end of the season. I mean, that Arsenal game at the end of last season was, was you know, one of my favourite games to cover. And there was nothing riding on it in terms of actually, you know, the, 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 I've been relegation battles and big games in the past, but that was one of my favourite games of all time. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens next year. And, and what's been really good is that this takeover has been great, but what they've done in the intervening months is exactly what I wanted them to do, which is lay foundations, go out and buy players like Sven Botman, Bruno Jumeres that, you know, I, I was worried that they'd come in and there would be this element. And I think a few fans were getting excited about the idea that they were going to go and sign these Hollywood players, like try and sign Neymar and go and sign Gareth Bale. And, you know, I think that would have been a short-term adrenaline hit, but I don't think it would have been the right thing to do for where they are and where the football world is. And, you know, what's going to be really exciting is seeing this team grow and seeing the stadium grow and Dan Ashworth put his imprint on, on a lot of things with the football club. So, yeah, long answer is basically, yeah, I, I I lived because I wanted to see this. I wanted to see what was going to happen. So, you know, I kind of stuck with it. And I wouldn't have taken the eye job if it, if it hadn't been covering Newcastle United, funnily enough, you know, because I wanted to keep doing it. Um, because the North East is, you know, it's, I think it's where I'm going to, you know, it's where I'm going to bring up my children. And, um, you know, and Newcastle United itself is such a, it's such a great football club. You know, it, it, there's so much enthusiasm for it in the city. And, and you know, just seeing it be successful, it's been horrible the last three or four years because it just felt like a slow death of a football club. Um, and to see it sort of revived in such a short space of time kind of backs up. You know, we, we were kind of, I think some of us were, were mocked, some of us journalists were mocked by kind of our compatriots in the, you know, the, some of the national press that you kind of looking on saying, you know, well, why do Newcastle fans kind of, where's those complaining? And it was like, they're not complaining. They're saying, if you give us something, you will see what this club can be. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Oh, we certainly are. We certainly are. You've mentioned the takeover a few times. We have to we have to talk about the very beginning of that takeover, of when it got announced. Sam and I were at Molyneux five days before it was announced, and two teams that you've covered, Mark Wolverhampton Wanderers and Newcastle. I actually said to Sam, I, I, mean, I think we were just chatting not long ago, and I actually seen the game on Sky, and I just watched from when Wolves scored their first goal to when Newcastle scored up to half time. It was only about twenty minutes. I'm thinking, oh my God, how it was just, you could, they like were playing 5 4 1 under obviously the four manager Steve Bruce. It was just dire. Even though when Jeff Hendricks scored, it was just a mm -hmm. dire performance. But the overriding emotion after that game wasn't even frustration. It was just. It was almost acceptance, numbness. wasn't it? Yeah, an acceptance of, acceptance of numbness. It was just, it was awful. But yeah. from th that final whistle in Wolverhampton to that takeover being announced, how quickly did you know that this was going to be done? And did you think, oh my God, Newcastle United are just about to erupt into this potential yeah. powerhouse in years to come? It was so odd. The whole takeover was weird because you, you forget like the first, I mean, it'd been going on for years and years and years. I mean, I, I've, I've just done a story about, because um, obviously I still cover other clubs now, I've just done a story about Everton and uh, the Peter Kenyon takeover. And funny enough, that had collapsed on Friday. And then the group are now telling us it's going to, it's going to, you know, we're, we're still in talks and stuff. And I was sitting there thinking, this is deja vu because how many times did that happen with Newcastle, you know? And you go to their group. And as it turned out, there were a few different groups. And even the one that has ended up getting the club, there were so many times where we were, we were told, Hang on to your hats. It's going to be this week. It's going to happen. And I think by the time the Wolverhampton thing, you know, we were being told for weeks before then, and even in the summer beforehand, um, that this this is going to happen. Don't worry about it. It's going to happen. And we we kept getting told. But the problem was because you get told so many times and it didn't happen. You know, we had the situation. I think in the September after the bid first got kind of well, it didn't get rejected did it, by the Premier League, but but we were told then. They were very close to the kind of um, the compromise, which ended up sort of green lighting the takeover. Um, and I remember like I wasn't kind of really on board. I didn't really get very far with that story at the time because I, I kind of had heard something, but I didn't I couldn't get it stood up. And then and then I think there were a slew of articles afterwards saying it nearly happened this week. And I remember sort of 
talking to one of my colleagues and saying, yeah, but they keep saying that. They're always saying that. So I think when we got to the point of after the Wolves game, there were loads of rumours again that, that it was, you know, look, it's going to happen. It's, it's, it, it's getting close. And I think, you know, every week it felt like something was going to happen. But the moment I the moment I started checking it out was when, do you remember on social media, there was the uh, list of people coming up on a private jet. It emerged. I think it was like, and uh, there'd been a few where there were a few like, you know, kind of like there's supposedly some movement in, amongst it. But on that list were three people who worked for the PR companies that I knew were working for um, Staveley and the club. Uh, well, not the club and the, the, the group that have, have ended up taking over. And I was like, there's no way that at least two of those names, I was like, I don't think they're out in the public domain. So if somebody's faking this, they are doing a really like, this is an amazing <laughs> job. So one of the guys, I just texted him and um, when it all started kicking off, he didn't get back to me until the following morning. And so I knew then it looked, it's going to happen. And then you go through it to other sources and they all say it's going to happen. And then I remember on the morning that it happened, I got a phone call like about seven in the morning saying, right, um, this is what the Chronicle are getting. Um, it's going to happen. And I just remember sitting there like, it's like, could it still not happen? Is there still a way that it could happen? Is somebody <laughs> going to come in? Like, is, is Mike Ashley going to do something? But it was like, that was the point, I think, at which it happened. But I think it was an international break, wasn't it? So we had two weeks. So I think the first week, um, that was when it that was when it actually happened. And I think by it was so quick between the kind of Tuesday and the Thursday when it did actually happen. And there were so many, it snowballed really, really quickly. And what was really noticeable was there wasn't the pushback because at first you always got, whenever they said something, you got somebody from the Premier League or somebody from kind of within the Ashley group sort of pushing back and saying, look, they keep saying this, but we're, we're not aware that anything's going to happen at a time. You were just like, you know, not again. But there was no pushback. So we were kind of like started planning. And um, funnily enough, at the Chronicle, we had um, a plan. I, I'd spent two days in the summer, of the pandemic summer, um, like war gaming, what we were going to do day one, day two, day three, day four. So we had about four front pages. We had day one front page, day two front page, day three front page. So I was going, so I was like hurriedly going through all this stuff that we had. And um, half of it was kind of like, half of it still worked, but half of it, half of it didn't. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was great because what was really nice was right from the off. When I got that phone call, it was like, right, we want the Chronicle to be front and centre here. We, we, we want to get you down to Jesmond Dean House to talk to Amanda and um, straight away. And, and you know, and, and we had the open letter from Yasser al Ramayan, which is the only time I think he's kind of said anything about Newcastle United as well. So that was really nice because I thought, like, they'd get it. They understand. And um, it was just a brilliant week. Like, it was just a fantastic week. And, and like I said, I think it, it sort of has only really, I think, like sunk in. Um, around January when we kind of got to the point where it was like, wow, you know, yeah, this is a proper football club because they're actually going to do stuff. Um, but it was a great week. And and because it had been going on for so long and we'd had the pandemic summer was just weird because I kept getting, you know, every week we were told it was going to happen this week. And I kept telling, I kept telling my wife, we can't, I can't have this week off. I can't, you know, I can't take any time off because it's going to happen this week. <laughs> and by the end of it, I think I took a week off and I was like, oh, you know, and I kept, every day I was like, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen this week? And it ended up happening. And, and, and I think it was just so, you know, I think when, when we actually went in to speak to them, one of the PR guys for the consortium said to us, you know, the Chronicle kind of kept us going because there were times when, you know, we knew it was still going to happen, but we thought the, the fans are going to forget about this. And he said there would there would be a story about you know this is this this could be related to the takeover and stuff. And they were like, it kind of gave us a bit of hope. And I, I think by the end we got a little bit desperate when uh, Nick Demarco's bread was yeah. kind of being pushed out and stuff. You know, I think that was kind of like, but I mean, God, you you should see the amount of people that were reading those stories. It was ridiculous. And I was kind of like, I think this is possibly we we're possibly getting a little bit too far. But you know, to be fair, I think it did all kind of build this kind of momentum you know and people weren't prepared to give up on it and I think that did have an impact um, on the people involved in the consortium because if they were tempted to walk away I think they saw there was such enthusiasm for it that they just didn't want to you know and I think that was we were told that a few times along the way um, that you know yeah you, you guys kind of like kept the fans kind of going and there were some fans who said look just leave it just let it go but when you were talking to the kind of people that we were talking to it was obvious that they weren't going to let it go and the Premier League found themselves in such a pickle, I think, with the Saudi thing. There was no precedent really to to block it after they got rid of the the um, after the, there was that kind of detente between all those all the countries in the Gulf. I, I felt at that point it's only a matter of time, um, but I didn't know how how much longer it was going to take. And I didn't think it was going to take another like fifteen months after that. But but there you go. At least we're there here now, and it feels like normal, and it doesn't feel like you kind of 
we've got an idea of what they're about as well. I think that's the nice thing. Like it, the first thing I thought after the after we had it was, you know, God, wouldn't this be Newcastle United if they start? You know, if Dennis Wise turns up next week or something, or they've got some. You know, they've got some dodgy mates who they want to get in the football club and they've not told us about it, but they've got their foot through the door and it's like goes all wrong. And I'm just really pleased that, you know, that they've made some mistakes. And I think long term, they are going to make more mistakes and there's going to be times when we're all going to sort of say they shouldn't have done that. But I think the overriding principles, getting Dan Ashworth in, massive for me, absolutely huge, because adds it credibility and it, and it, and it you just look at them now and you think they've had a few, they've had like nine months they're bringing the right kind of players in. They've got a good manager. They've got a really good manager, the right person for this phase of this takeover. And I think in years to come, they will be battling for the very top players. Um, but I think it's a few years away. And, and um, you know, I think we've got more of an idea of what they're about. And even in a summer where, you know, probably they've been sending out the message that they're not going to spend a whole load of money. They've signed some really good players already. Um, and I think players, I think there'll be more to come as well. So, um, yeah, it feels like not only are we beyond that first adrenaline hit, but we've got an idea of what they're about. And I kind of like the cut of their jib. Oh, 100%. I mean, even with the, like, kind of minor mistakes they've made, like, it's always been, like, the heart's still been in the right place, you know. But, like... Twitter goes in a frenzy when like windows were being cleaned and statues are being moved and bars are being renamed back to what they should be, which is just little details like that for a Newcastle United fan base, I think makes all the difference. And it, it, long may it continue because I think yeah. it's great. But you mentioned there, Mark, about um, Dan Ashworth. What sort of influence are you seeing on the club from him already? Because am I right in saying that he had a bit of influence over the signing of Nick Pope instead of Dean Henderson, who was obviously heavily linked before he went to Forest on loan. Yeah, I think I think he did. I think there was some um, there was some uh, some sort of influence there. I think the Henderson thing they'd obviously done a little bit of due diligence on it, and I think they, I, 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 from my reading of it, what happened there was that they they didn't they don't want to bring in a goalkeeper who expected to play every week because the idea was to bring him in. They've got a very good goalkeeper there in Martin Dubravka already. And the idea is whoever, you know, it's almost throwing some remit out there for the, the pair of them. Whoever plays best will get in the team. I think probably Nick Pope will start as number one. But you've got Martin Dubravka there as well, who's who's going to be in there. And I think with Henderson, it was very much an expectation. He wants to be in the team because he feels like he wants to get into the, the, the World Cup squad. He's had, a, he's had a year of playing number two, second fiddle, or two years now of playing second fiddle. So, he, you know, I think there was, I think probably they got an impression there that, that he was only going to come if he was going to be guaranteed number one. I don't think that that was what happened. I think they also didn't really want to do the loan um, with with um, with an option to buy, which is obviously what, what Manchester United are looking to do because I think they, they, they're they not sure about whether they want to sell him or not. So I think Nick Pope, to me, felt like the right one anyway. Good character, um, which is something that underpins all of it. Um, Ashworth, I think, the, the, what the, the the start, what the, the very first thing is he, he's um, he's had a bit of time to to kind of look at the the different layers of management in Newcastle and what is really um, apparent at Newcastle, and, and this has been apparent for a long time. Is that club has been? I think it's been hollowed out by Ashley, but I think it's just been left in. 2005 and the rest of the Premier League are in 2020 you know in 2022 and they are you know you you you're talking about Liverpool having a loans department that's got you know analysts dedicated to players out on loan a loans manager an assistant loan an assistant loan manager um, Manchester City have got like a um, head of performance and a head of injury solely for loan players Newcastle had Shola Amiobi and you know with the Elliot Anderson thing Shoulder Army Obi calling Joey Barton and saying, please take Elliot Anderson because, because his loan to uh, Millwall and Sheffield Wednesday have fallen through. Please, please take him. And it's like, that's, the, you know, well done to Shoulder for getting that loan out there. But that loan department is a critical part of the pathway to the first team. And they haven't done that very well in, in recent years. It's not a fault of Shoulder Army Obi's. He's, he's done what he can do, but he was on his own effectively doing it. Whereas you've got other clubs that have these big structures and, and other clubs, including Brighton, where Dan Ashwood's come from, that have these, these structures in place. Um, you need people, you need people working on the football side of it. And Newcastle just haven't had anybody working on the football side of it. They've not had a director of football. They, they were one of only two clubs in the Premier League last year that didn't have one. 
Um, and Ashworth has gone in, and I think he's seen what the owners have said a long time, which is there needs to be a lot of investment in people. There needs to be good people coming in. You know, they've brought in a head of uh, head of nutrition. There's more first team um, analysts coming in. They're going to bring in academy scouts. Um, two weeks ago, I wrote um, they're they're recruiting scouts to scout in Teesside um, and Middlesbrough. Now that's kind of like something that they hadn't they hadn't done before, but they. Ashwood's come in. He knows the Brexit. You know, he knows the Brexit situation has made, meant that bringing players in from the EU is is difficult. So they need to they need to be out there getting the very best from the northeast. And you know that is one of the areas I think where he's going to be he's going to be really big as well. But I think he also brings a, a, a different element to transfer negotiations. You know, Sven Botman. They effectively last week, um, when it was not last week, the week before, uh, went to Lille and said, "Look, we're about to move on with this." Um, you know, there's a take it or leave it there. Um, if he doesn't want to come, if you don't think he wants to come, if you don't want to sell him, we will move on to our next target. Um, and the deal got done. And that was a kind of the boldness of somebody, I think, who's who's been through those negotiations quite a lot. The transfer committee that they had in place in January eventually did, did the business. But I think everybody would tell you it was pretty fraught before then. And I think Dan Ashworth just brings that sort of coolness. So, He's good. I think he'll he'll take a front front line with transfer negotiations. Um, but more than that, I think he's. You know, I think you'll see medicine, um, performance, um, the academy, uh, recruitment. All those things will change, and a lot of these things you probably won't see a lot of. Um, you know, a lot of people coming in. You may you maybe won't recognise some of the names, but there's going to be a, a few more layers of kind of uh, people going in going to those jobs. You know, I mean Newcastle's media department is probably one of the smallest, I think, in the Premier League, as far as I know. So, you know, it'd be good to see that kind of thing change, you know, so they could do a bit more with um, for, for fans, because I know, you know, they do some really, really good stuff there. Um, but, you know, they need people. They need more people in there. And, and, and I've always said, you know, they need fan liaison people. They need, um, you know, th th this head of nutrition, I think, is really interesting because Newcastle have always been quite good, I think, on uh, they work with Orico, which is a kind of Irish firm who do a lot of this biomarker stuff. So they take bloods and, and you know, they can they're, they're quite pioneering on that. And that's Dr. Paul Katzen, who's who's taken a lead on that. But, you know, they only have a set number of people at the club to do that. So it's great that they're bringing in a kind of assistant. I think they're bringing in somebody to go under Paul Katzen as well. They're bringing in an assistant head of medicine, I think. Um, so loads of those kind of things are happening. Loads of those those things have happened this summer. And that's Ashworth. That's the club having done their strategic review and deciding to put those people in. And, and I think that's where you'll see long term benefits of what's happening this this summer. It may not be the kind of flashiest thing, but that will be that will that will kind of come in because until pretty much May, June, you know, it was very much the same club, the same facilities, the same structures just with better players because of what they've done in January. And now I think you're starting to see the structures improve, but it's going to be a long-term process. You know, I mean, I think it's going to be 10 years before the club is elite in the Premier League because they're going to need that many transfer windows. They're going to need to have that training ground redeveloped. I mean, they're obviously doing a bit of work on it now, but um, when you go to some of the training grounds in the Premier League, I mean, Manchester City is, in, you know, insane. It's, it's just incredible. Liverpool is, you know, you know, these things, I mean, Leicester City, we all, you know, before the takeover happened, we looked at Leicester City and thought, why could that be Newcastle? And Newcastle's facility is OK, but it's, you know, this comes in the championship with better facilities than Newcastle. And that is unacceptable. Uh, and that's solely because Mike Ashley didn't want to put money in. But these but these owners will. Um, and I think that's where you'll see. That's why it's so important to have a person like Dan Ash within, because he'll 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 know what he's doing with that. I mean, I think his big thing and he's really from when you speak to people who've worked with him is he's very good at having one leg in the kind of the boardroom and one leg in the kind of dugout. So he bridges that gap. And I think, you know, Eddie Howe's done that quite well so far, but he really needs to be involved with the football side of it. And he needed somebody else involved. You know, he couldn't be doing the transfer window like he did in January, every single transfer window. Cause I just don't think, you know, he's probably got enough gas in the tank. I don't think anybody would have enough gas in the tank to do what Newcastle did in January. Um, so to have Ashworth there, who's going to be able to kind of, represent what Eddie Howe wants to the ownership group is um, is really important. Yeah, I, I, I think Newcastle fans will might might not say this now, but they might say this in years to come, that Dan Ashworth is the signing of the summer and he's not going to do anything on the football pitch. That could be something that we'll have to look at in the future. But to, going on to signings, we've, you mentioned Sven Botman has already arrived, Nick Pope has already arrived, Mike Target, of course, was already at 
Newcastle since January, but also your permanent transfer. What is the latest, uh, Mark, in, from what you know in regards? I'm just going to throw out a few names. I think there's there's always new names every single day. I'm, I'm just, I've, I've kind of got down to about three or four. So if I've missed yeah. any out, and for people listening, I apologise. For people watching on YouTube, I know I'm going to get pelters. So first name, Hugo Ekatika. Where are we? Where are we with this one? Because it seems that for for what it's worth, it's not dead. But Newcastle are thinking, right, we're going to go to somebody else, maybe Abroja, who is my second name, mm. um, and Musa Diaby as well. That seems to be a name mm. that a lot of people have been excited about. In those three, in any particular order you like, Mark, take it away. <laughs> so, Ekatiki, yeah, there we go. Um, so, I think, I think for, for a start, I think what we're seeing now is Newcastle have got their priority targets that they, that they wanted to, to get in. They wanted they, the defence was quite an important. Um, they wanted to do those final final uh, deals. The you know, left back was was absolutely crucial. They had a look at a few different names and then and then ended up going to my target goalkeeper. Um, you know, it was quite interesting because when we went down to do a kind of end of season chat with uh, Eddie Howe, um, I kept asking him about the goalkeeper because I was I, I remember saying to Chris Woff, my uh, you know my former colleague, like you know it's so funny the way he answers that question about the goalkeepers. I was like. He's clearly they're clearly going to go and buy a goalkeeper this summer because he, he the way he answers is like a politician. So it was obvious that they wanted a goalkeeper, another goalkeeper in, and I think it was a very good move that for me because you need that needed refreshing. You know, we've talked about Freddie Woodman being the next cab off the rank for a long time, but it, it didn't happen for him last season. And you know, he's a very good goalkeeper. He needed first team football to go, so it, it become a bit stale because that idea that he was going to be the next cab off the ranks wasn't happening. Um, so I think they did a really good thing. They've got an outstanding goal, uh, an outstanding goalkeeper as well. And then Sven Botman, long-term target. They needed another um, centre-back. I think Federico Fernandez probably isn't going to play too much. I think he may even leave. Uh, Fabian Scher, obviously, he's the right-sided centre-back. You know, you kind of look at him and think, yeah, he, he could he could, he could, could get a few more games. And they obviously gave him a new, a new contract as well. Um, Dan Burns and super work. But they needed somebody in. And I think that Botman, in Botman, they think he's going to be the next outstanding European centre-back. So, you know, uh, but it's going to take a while. So I think they think they've got him for 36 million, but potentially could be 100 million in a few years is what is what they think, which is which is really exciting. I think now we're probably seeing a pause in the market. The striker market is, is not an easy one to do. You see other clubs trying to sign strikers as well. I mean, Liverpool got off, off the mark to get Darwin Nunes. He was somebody Newcastle tried to get in January and I think still harboured a slight hope to get um, this summer as well. But obviously when, when Liverpool or Manchester United come in, I think they knew that that wasn't going to happen. So they went back to Ekatiki, who again is in the Botman mould of, we can get him for 20 million now and he might be worth 80 million in two or three years. But the worry I think has always been that, is he the right character? You know, they, they did due diligence on him and felt he was and felt he would he would come in and be out, you know, be a, a kind of, you know, an outstanding potential and he would come into a group because sometimes you know we talk about kind of the, the kind of no dickhead policy if you will and like you don't they don't all have to be the same type they don't all have to be kind of happy to sit on the bench of Chris Wood sort of type um because they'll get absorbed into the group but there was always those slight concerns I think about him and whether he actually wanted to come to Newcastle so those concerns have been realized a little bit so I I, I mean as you said it's not dead because they've put a lot of work into it and I think if he turns around tomorrow and sort of says, yeah, I want to, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to sign for Newcastle. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm really, I'm really keen on it. I think they would take him because he is still outstanding. They've done that work on him. They've scouted him. They've seen what a good player he is. But I think it's, it feels like they're ready to move on. And I think the, the key for Newcastle now is they've got a lot of names that they're, that they're keen on. So Dominic Calvert-Lewin was obviously one that they were really keen on. I don't think he'll leave, he'll leave Everton now. Um, although, you know, he could if the, if the right, the right sort of bid comes in. But Brozier, I think, is one I mentioned in April. I think I kind of said they were interested in him back in April. But again, he was, um, you know, he, he he was, he is somebody that Chelsea won quite a lot of money for. West Ham are interested. Southampton are interested. Nobody yet has taken that, taken that sort of, plug like what I think they would like to do with somebody like Brozier is a loan with an option with a, with an obligation to buy at the end of the season but Chelsea will be assessing all the all the options and if West Ham come in and pay the money for him then Newcastle are kind of going to get blown blown away again they do have some targets um from my understanding in Europe as well so it wouldn't surprise me if they went back to that but I think they think at the moment they've probably got enough strikers they will probably try and sign somebody but I think they think look it's not it, we, if we wait 
bit further on in the in the window, things might become, you know, some things might kind of loosen out a little bit, as it did in January with Bruno Jimenez. I don't think at the start of the window they went out looking for Bruno, but he became, it became obvious that he was one of the targets that, that they could get. And they did end up getting him and had probably got him a, a, a window earlier than they would, maybe would have done. So it wouldn't surprise me if they kind of, if, if they wait and see what happens with the market, because there's a lot of trading still to be done. You know, if Raheem Sterling goes to Chelsea, does that, that then pretty much says Broja's not going to be kind of involved, I think, very much. So a Chelsea going to then be looking to, to kind of, uh, to, to kind of sell, which is what Manchester City have done. This summer they've brought players in, but then they've sold because they don't want to go. You know, they don't. They don't want to sell a lot of money. So I think that you know, I think Bros is definitely one that I would watch. They they're really keen on him. Um, I know that they watched him sort of four or five times um, between January and the end of the season, um, and really positive scouting reports on him. A good player would fit into their their system. You know, he's, he he would offer um, goals, and he's kind of you know he's again a long you know a lot to. A lot to improve on on his game as well, so I, it wouldn't surprise me if that if that's one that, that, that they go for. But I, I I don't think there's going to be anything like between now, maybe in kind of the thick end of pre season. You know, they might get somebody in before the start of the season, but um, I'm not thinking there's going to be anybody next week. You know, there may be some some sort of you know um, new names thrown out as well. But I I, I think you know I, I don't think it'll be. I don't think it'll be next week. I think it'll be kind of more towards, you know, they'll, they'll probably give one or two of the players a, um, a, a you know, a, a, a go. And, and obviously if Callum Wilson, if Callum Wilson's fit, you know, he's going to play, you know, he's going to be the, the man. I think probably look at the system that that they like, that, he, that Eddie Howe likes to play. It's got, you know, it really only needs that one sort of outstanding striker. But, you know, they probably do need, they do need that. And they need a, I think they still need a winger as well. You know, and I, and I would still say they could do the centre midfielder as well, personally. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if they do go out and get all those, all those, uh, all those three, three players. I mean, so you give me uh, Ekatike, Broja, and who was the other one? Sorry, I was going to say Musa Diaby, Darby. but I think yeah, I think, Diaby's uh, yeah, Diaby's a really interesting one because I think that they really like Diaby, um, and you know. They would sell. There's definitely a, a chance for them to sell. And I think Newcastle, you know, we, for all the talk of the budget, they have, I think they have an attitude where, yes, we have a budget, but we will push the boat out if somebody becomes available who we think is going to really, really improve us. So I think that'll be what that'll be what happened. It was always the case, you know, way back in time that Newcastle didn't have a budget. They don't sit down with numbers and say, we've got 100 million, we've got 60 million, we've got 40 million. It's not it's just not that way. What they do is they have a rough idea of what they're going to do. And then I think with this current transfer team, they will possibly go and sign somebody if they think there's an outstanding bargain to be done there or a player becomes um, available who, who can who can do something. That's what I've been kind of told. But they always have to be the right player, somebody who's going to push them on uh, and future-proof them. But the difficulty they've got at the moment, of course, is that they don't have those commercial deals which are going to increase their um wiggle room within financial fair play so they're sort of thinking we want to leave it open a little bit to you know potentially january is an option as well um because when we spoke to pif way back when the deal the first deal kind of got nixed they said 50 million every transfer window for five years so which isn't loads is it i mean i was i thought when they said that originally to me i was like it's not transformative cash it's 250 million pound for five years but it's not transformative money it's not going to turn you into the top four um straight away it's going to kind of it's going to kind of require some clever player trading now they spent 100 million in the last window they've already spent best part of 50 million in this window so um you know there's probably only wiggle room for maybe another 30 40 million i would say there so you know could DRB come in and they would probably have to push the boat out a little bit, but I think they probably would do it if they felt that he was, um, he was available and um, was going to do it. But I think he may, it may be that, that they look, because I think he's got, he's still got a few years left on his contract. So it may be that they kind of keep an eye on that one and come back to it because you've already seen, you've already seen with Botman, you know, they will keep pursuing targets and they're not, they're not going to be afraid of kind of going back to people that they knew. And the same with Ekatike as well. So, um, so yeah, I think there'll be definitely, there's definitely going to look, there's no doubt in my mind, there's going to be at least one or two more players coming in, but they also need to sell as well. So, um, that could be the next thing to, to sort of watch is players, players going out rather than, um, you know, rather than coming back in. That, that's the kind of one thing I suppose that's been missing so far is that that marquee signing for the final third. 
obviously we had Trippier, which started it all, and and Bruno's just been an absolute worldy. I mean, you said there that that, that wasn't the plan to bring him in in January, but oh, I'm glad they did. Yeah, and, amazing. Uh, and then, and then Botman, who I've always said like could be our Vincent company for the next five, ten years, but there's not been that one marquee signing to 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 really like widen your eyes and go, oh, 15, 20 goals a season, because you can't rely on Callum Wilson to stay fit as much as we'd all love to. But is that because, Mark, as you kind of alluded to there, that there is a kind of fear of FFP and the sponsorship deals haven't come yet? And, all right, we've got the 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 sleeve sponsor, that noon, which is fairly lucrative for a sleeve sponsor, but and I've, the logo's hideous, of course, it is, as, as all logos are, but... <laughs> And are they concerned about not being able to shift the dead wood in the squad? Yeah, I think I think one of the reasons why there's probably not been a marquee name so far is, you know, look, if we, we sort of say they're not going to go for a bail, they're not going to go for those veterans. Um, but I think, you know, look, they'd be stupid if somebody came on the market who was top class talent, you know, a kind of really, really high end talent who they could get, they would probably go for it. I think at the moment, Newcastle aren't far enough along the project to be for those kind of players to want to come to Newcastle. You need to be able to offer Champions League football, or you need to at least, very least, offer Europa League football. I mean, you hear you hear Jimenez talking about um, Champions League and being there, and Sven Botman says the same thing as well. So those players want to play Champions League football, and they will require Champions League football in the next few years. You know, there's going to have to be, there's going to be some pressure on Newcastle, I think, in the next two to three years um, to get to get to that level. And that will unlock those kind of players. I think it's it's all very well sort of saying, you know, look, it's Newcastle, you can come play in front of this big crowd. And I think that has, that does attract the, play, the kind of calibre of players that they've signed now. But to get that next level where everybody's sort of talking about, wow, you know, that, you know, they're really, really mean business, those top, 20, 30 goal a season strikers that kind of knew that Liverpool have got the, the Darwin Nunes of this world. You need to be able to offer Champions League football as well as, a, as an attractive wage structure as well. So I think that's for me what what, what needs to happen. Um, the money will be there. I think they will end up getting commercial deals that you know blow what they've had before out of the window. You know, I think Castor wouldn't be here if this the PIF um, takeover had happened two years before. I think it would probably have been somebody else. Um, so those kind of deals will come along, but Mike Ashley had tied them into quite a lot of deals that didn't pay market share. So that's something that they're battling against at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that will come. And the good thing is there is patience within this ownership group. And I think patience within the supporters as well to recognise that these are the kind of players that we we, we want. Um, Newcastle actually have been signing these kind of players before under Ashley, but the difference was, the vision then was, come to us and you can move on to an Arsenal or a Liverpool or a kind of, you know, a, a top team. Now it's come with us, be on our journey and come to the next stage. And that's what they need to do. You know, that's what they need to do. And they will move with the market. So if those, if the strikers are 70 million, they will pay 70 million for a striker. Whereas with Ashley, it was like, we'll pay 35 million for a midfielder or a defender. But when it came to the strikers, they were just like, we, we, we're just not going to pay that kind of money. And that's what ended up, I think, killing them in the end. It's, it's, I'm just going to have to go and get my... I'm just going to have to go and get my power pack because it's going down to zero. Yeah. So I'll just oh. go and get it. I'll be back in one second. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> no, me, and, me and Sam, will, me and Sam will, will carry on the conversation. I think it's really, really interesting what Mark's talking about there, Sam, because the sponsorships, any sort of sponsorship for Newcastle United right now will take them financially into a different level. And the sooner they get there, the sooner it comes a little bit easier with everything else. It all kind of just works together, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's just another arm of, of um, Ashley, the, the, the knock-on effect of having Mike Ashley. I mean, how much was he paying for plaster and his tacky sports brand all over St. James's? Not a lot, was he? So it, it, it's, just, it's, it's just another one of these wonderful legacies that that um, so-and-so has left behind. But, you know... It's a slow build. It's an exciting. It's an exciting time. It. It's. It's not. Things can't be as instant as when you know Abramovich came in and took over Chelsea, and when um, Man City had their takeover as well. And look, that there's still a lot of players that have been brilliant servants for the club over the past few years, 
And like, as Mark referenced before, no dickheads. I mean, if we had a lot of dickheads in the squad, that we would have been relegated before now. So like, you, 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 your likes of Matt Riches, Kieran Clarks, Isaac Hayden, who we had on last week, of course, who's gone to Norwich. Brilliant players for that time, but they probably had their time at Newcastle. And, and Matt Ritchie should be an absolute legend for, for Newcastle over the past few years because he's done wonders for us. I do you know what the, the funny thing about those kind of players was, and it, it, I always I think, and, and it was it was really apparent after Rafa Benitez left, and 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 Steve Bruce is kind of like was was handed I think a hospital pass in a lot of ways, and Newcastle did this a lot under Lee Charnley. Um, they renewed contracts when oh. players were ready, were, were, should have gone, and players probably wanted to go. I mean, I think back to Fabrizio Colaccini getting an extra two years. Um, you know, and and soured his legacy really because he didn't want to be here. Newcastle needed to move on, and they and they they kept renewing contracts. And and what you saw, and I think it was a, you know, towards the end of the the last summer and the year, and I think the summer before as well, was an, a managing director. I think who had no no like I don't think he was even shy about sort of being. You know, he was a caretaker, a managing director for the last three years. The, the the idea was, and Steve Bruce has said this himself, was the idea was keep us in the Premier League, keep us ticking along so that when this takeover happens, we're in a position where we're not trying to battle from the championship. So what they did was they renewed all of those players' contracts who should have gone. Um, Fernandez, Carl Darlow getting a five-year contract, you know. Um, Dwight Gale. Gale. I mean, to be fair with the Dwight Gale situation, it was, um, you know, I, I still can't believe that he's had two contract extensions at Newcastle at a time when he barely played. I mean, I think he's played more than 10 games in the last three or four years, but he's had, you know, two new contracts. And, you know, that is the problem you need. I said, it's not just, and obviously the players coming in are the ones that, that really, you know, I think I think really kind of get us off our seats. But Newcastle don't just need to sell those players. They also need to be kind of creative sellers. You see Liverpool, who I think are the best in terms of their recruitment model in the Premier League by a long, long, long way being prepared this summer to sell Sadio Mane because they know he's got a year left on his contract and they are prepared to be aggressive in the market, go out and sign a player in Darwin Duno who they think is going to be long-term, very, very good for them. They, they sell Sadio Mane because they know that if they keep him, you know, it's going to, it's going to be a destabilising force. Newcastle need to do that as well. They did it for a little bit of time. Um, they were, you know, they were prepared, I think that one year in 2012, when they prepared, they, and I think that was motivated by trying to break up the leadership group, because Mike Ashley didn't like to have a lot of players who, who, who kind of had a lot of opinions, but they broke up that leadership group, replenished it with better players. If you can make that your your strategy, I mean, you don't want to do that every summer, but, you know, we we keep hearing these these words around Alan Samaxman, you know, is he happy? Does he want to, you know, does he want 120, does he want 150,000 contracts? You know, is he, is he this, you know, does he think that he's, you know, a player who could play at any club in the in the world. Well, I think probably what you need to do in that situation is grab the ball by the horns a little bit and maybe cash in on a player like that. And I'm not saying I wouldn't with Alan Samax, but I'd definitely have him for another year and see where he goes. But it's a big year for him because I think he needs to deliver on on you know consistently on what we think he can do because you know he's getting better towards the end of the season. But he had a long chunk in the middle of the season where I don't think he was doing exactly as well as he should. But Newcastle need to be aggressive in the transfer market. They need to bring in the best, but they also need to sell. They also need to replenish that team, and they need to send a message to some of the players within that team that they can't. They have, their position is not there to be taken for granted. I think that's what they've done with Nick Pope coming in with Martin Dubravka. You know, he was a clear number one, and he did make some mistakes last season. And he's a good guy, and I think he's a good, very, very good goalkeeper. But he wasn't under any threat. I don't think from Carl Dollar. Yeah, I mean. Obviously, Darlow's a number two and, you know, bring him in and he, you know, he could get a run of games, but he's not, he was never going to unseat Martin Dubravka long term. Now you've got Nick Pope there. And I think that is a genuine battle for supremacy and it should bring out the best in the other goalkeeper. And I think if Newcastle can get that situation where they've got, you know, they've got a lot of good players all competing for these, for these positions, that's when they're going to get better. Um, Rafa did it, but he did it with a lower level of player. So he had a kind of, you know, he had four or five players all going for, you know, all going for a slot who were all of this kind of like probably lower mid-table Premier League level. If Newcastle can get that with players who were all kind of, 
top eight players, they're going to be in a really good position. And I think that's what they need to do. That's what we're talking about with squad building. It isn't just about bringing players in. It's about getting rid of players and being prepared to be a little bit bold in the transfer market, which is something they haven't been for five, six years. They've not been progressive in the transfer market. They've let players be here for a long time. I mean, you, you, you know, you look at this, some of the names that came back for pre-season and there's a few you're like, God, you know, I forgot, you know, how many games is he going to play this season? You know, they've got, they've got, um, you know, Jamal Lewis coming, coming back. He didn't get in the squad last year. I mean, you know, where, are the, where's the improvement going to come from in the squad? And, they, and I think they need to sell. They need to sell players. They need to um, have a whole different attitude to the transfer market. And I think we'll see that in the next few years as well. But the, the main thing I think in January was to bring in the players that keep them up. And this time it's to build on it. I think to get to top eight would be would be amazing next season with a run in the cups. Um, and I think they're building a squad that's capable of doing that. It needs a couple of forward players, I think, uh, and then you know get rid of some of the some of the players who maybe um, like you said it's best for them to move on. The guys like Hayden who want to play. Um, Richie wants to play, um, and I don't think he'd be satisfied to just sit on sit on the bench and do nothing. Um, but the problem with doing that at the moment is that the champ the money's gone out of the championship, so nobody has the money to um, pay the contracts that they're on at the moment. So Newcastle are probably going to have to subsidise quite a lot of those wages, I think, to um, uh, to get rid of them. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating seeing who actually does leave this window, whether be permanent or on loan. Obviously, we've seen a couple already, as Sam's mentioned, like the Freddie Woodman, Isaac Caden, but it is definitely one to watch. I want to talk about the manager, uh, Eddie Howe, because I, I think, if I'm right in saying, when Steve Bruce was sacked and Eddie Howe came in, I think fans were on board with the decision of Eddie Howe, but I think, well, obviously, Sam will mention uh, Unai Emery as someone as that the, the ownership uh we're looking at and I think it was it was probably their number one choice in the end but I do feel like this was the right decision by a crunchy man not necessarily because you can see the results on the pitch but I just think the overall off the pitch you can just see that the, the players the fans the, everybody trusts him and the process of him in the next few years at Newcastle that could be something really really incredible um what's been the most impressive part that and most impressive part that you've seen in Eddie Howe Mark God, there's so many things I think that that little things I think that, that that impress you about him. I think what's been really good is the culture that he's built in the in the club. Um, I think it's a great interview with John Joe Shelby a few weeks ago where he said that one of the first things he, he got the players to do was write down the names of their kids and their wife and you know their, their, you know the um, a little bit about their family. So he wanted to value them as people, not just as a footballer. And I think what what he's done really well is he's he's built this culture of continuous improvement um but he's done it with a kind of human face and i think what he's done what he's managed to do really well is build on the kind of legacy and the good things that we saw in rafa benitez who was a fantastic coach and drove the club drove standards quite high but was a bit of a you know i think i don't know what the what the right way to say it was probably from an era that's possibly moving on and I think you've seen that in some of the other clubs that he's been at where he hasn't had the same success Eddie Howe's got that modern he's a modern manager you know he's not he's not somebody who's going to come in and and kind of want to dictate everything he, he, he's quite collaborative but by the same token he, he's he's building he's building a culture where the players want to get better and the players are going to get better under him and I think that what's been so impressive with him is the number of players who have improved talk about Joe Linton because you know he's the one that, that really he saw something in um but there's loads of players like that there's, there's all through the all through the squad there's players who've improved under him I think Callum Wilson you saw at the end it was a better striker than he was beforehand you know there's, there's there's been so many players who I think you've got better under him um and that culture is really really difficult to build and I think he, he touched on it when we spoke to him at the end of the season was like we we've, we've got a job on to get the right players in um because we want people to come in and buy into this culture of what we're trying to build. I mean, they sort they talk about kind of it's like they talk about relentlessness is, is one of the things they say. Relentless, be better every day. Those are the kind of things that they come up with, and they sound like trite sound sound bites. But when you realise that's actually what they're trying to do at the club, um, then you realise that, that that there's something good is building. And I think those kind of team photos that we all kind of miss. You know, I'm I'm missing them. You know, I want I want to see them every Saturday. I'm yeah. kind of like the summer's just not the same without it, is it? Uh, but those are the kind of things that, you know, uh, you know, uh, Eddie Howe has put that culture in place. He's told the players, you know, enjoy it. You know, don't 
don't you know be part of this football club and what it's building you know don't see yourself as kind of like against everything which which we had before and for me that's the most impressive thing tactically i think he's been really good i think i can only count on like maybe twice or three times where he set up a team and I've thought he's not quite got that right. And certainly after he got the players in in January, I can't think of too many times that the team was set up badly. Maybe at Spurs where they were a little bit open um, and they got punished, but they got punished by a good Spurs team. Man City, you know, yeah, again, hard to go there and, and the, the form that they were in. But tactically, I think he's been excellent. And, you know, you saw the Arsenal game at the end of the season how well they were playing and they just had momentum by the end. Everybody knew what they were meant to be doing. Um, but Newcastle were bold. They they, they said they, they wanted to have a high press. Um, they wanted to have a high press, but they also wanted to be a team that, you know, that, that you know, they're relentless, they have a high press, but they know what they're doing with it. You know, they're not, it's not that, that they're, they're pressing teams and then they're kind of like, you know, they're, they're going to play counter-attack, which other teams do. They're, they're, they're happy to have the ball. And I think that's what's been so good is you forget what a mess they were in the Steve Bruce. They, there was no discernible style. And now you can say what an Eddie Howe team is. It's a high press. It's intensity. It's um, you know, it's 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 a team that aren't aren't afraid of getting in, in another team's face. And they're not afraid to take a few risks as well. So so for me, the culture and just tactically, how good he's been. Because I knew he was, I knew he was good tactically from from everything that you'd heard around him. Obviously, he'd had the relegation at Bournemouth, so he got a few things wrong then. But for me, you know, the way that the transformation in that team from being a kind of, I mean, what were they under Steve Bruce? Nobody could tell you. You know, they 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 were a very defensive team, but a team that kind of scraped results from time to time, but, you know, stopped scraping results and were bottom of the league when he came in. That transition from that to what we saw at the end of the season was incredible. And yes, there was a bit of money there to spend, but a lot of the improvement came from players that he, he'd inherited. So that, for me, was, was, was incredibly, uh, incredibly uplifting. And I think you know, is a, is a really positive for next season as well. It's interesting listening to him talk again as well, whereas, again, with his predecessor, you're not just kind of... I can imagine it. Steve Bruce's press conferences would get a bit stale because, OK, he's going to talk up the opposition, he, he's going to make a gaffe somewhere about bacon or whatever, just... Ugh. But it's like it was like when Rafa was in charge, it was interesting. His press conferences were interesting. You'd learn stuff. You'd want to, you'd want to listen, and and I get that sense that Eddie Howe's from that mould. Yeah, I think I think the funny thing with with Rafa was the the, the problem we got with the, a lot of those press conferences was, I think we only ever had about four or five weeks in between transfer windows where it was about football, and the other time it was just about trying to extricate from them whether he was going to stay for another, you know, until yeah. the until the next transfer window because he was so permanently sort of annoyed with with everything that was going on in Newcastle and, and he did use those press conferences to kind of play a few political games what's nice about Eddie Howe is that he is he is you know I think he knows that he, he doesn't give much away in terms of you know he's not a he's not somebody who's going to come in and be controversial and start start fights and things but he does he's happy to talk and he and like you said I think he's he, he the, the messages that come over are the right ones. He's he's ambitious for Newcastle. And the problem with, with Steve Bruce was sometimes he was a bit too honest for his own good. And he was quite, you know, he, he was part of this regime that, as I said, we're just trying to tick along. And one of the, the most honest things that Steve Bruce ever said was, my job is just to keep the team ticking along, which is, you know, so like terrible when you think about it, a club of Newcastle United size. What's great for Eddie Howe is that he, he has this opportunity to talk about a club that has ambition and wants to wants to aim high and wants to wants to get there. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, uh, he's an intelligent guy, and he's 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 a pleasure to listen to. I think when you go into his press conferences, because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't patronise you. He's very um, open and um, respectful as well. There's a lot of mutual respect, I think, between him and the journalists on the patch as well, which is which is great, you know, and, and that had been lost, I think, on Steve Bruce. And he'd probably tell you that that was because the journalists weren't treating him with respect. And I would sort of say that it, it was just, you know, it just wasn't a good relationship by the end. It was toxic. It had been toxic almost from the start. Um, and, um, you know, it was just, he should never have got the job. And I think he should never have taken the job. Um, and then we, we would have had the problems that he ended up having. Um, but it, it, and it showed it in the press conferences by the end. It was all, it wasn't much fun by the end. Whereas with Eddie Howe, it's totally different. It's, it's you know, it's a guy who, you know, his predecessor called him 
that fellow who relegated Bournemouth, didn't he? I think which was which is kind of like that. That was sort of towards the end. It, it became a bit like that with Steve Bruce. I think he he was just fighting so many fires. He just ended up putting his foot in it one way or another. And what's good about Eddie Howe is the fans are much more on board, so they're not studying everything he says to look for a gaff or to look for him saying something that was going to, it's going to, you know, that, 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 you know, quite rightly is going to offend them. Um, they're just happy to listen to Eddie Howe and, talk, and listen to what he says about football and what he says about the ambitions of the club. So for me, that's, that's the biggest thing about going to those press conferences. You know, he's going to get a fair hearing. Um, so he's happier to say things. There's a better atmosphere around the club. You know, I know speaking to the press team, you know, they, they're enjoying it a lot more because they feel they can, do things that, you know, they're not just going to get, you know, they, they can tweet things out from the club account. It's not just going to be all sort of Ashley out and, you know, tweets about sports direct and stuff. So it, that's where you get this, all this positivity and Eddie Howe taps into that. And I think he's, he's tapped into it really well. He's been very positive. The players have been encouraged to tell their own stories, been some brilliant interviews. Um, you know, Chris did a piece with Dan Byrne, I think towards the end of last season, really good stuff. So loads of my colleagues have done some good good interviews, but, th- but they're putting the players up and their players are being able to tell their stories. And I think that's why we're seeing so much positivity around the, the current crop and, and, Eddie Howe, and, Eddie, and Eddie Howe himself. Yeah, it's just nice. I, think, I like the word fun. It is just fun watching yeah. Newcastle United wear. It's probably a chore uh, for a lot of people, oh. good than myself. But, uh, it was <laughs> reported on them, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Well. Definitely. But just finally, Mark, where will Newcastle United be in five years' time? And eighth place next season, is that what you think? I think eighth next year is realistic. I think they are already amongst the best of the rest. I think, you know, they, they, they have a claim to be in there with with Wolves, in there with a kind of, you know, some of those other teams, Crystal Palace. You know, you wouldn't, with the squad that Newcastle have got at the moment, You'd feel that they're not like comprehensively better than those clubs yet, but on their day, um, and Newcastle, I think they're going to have more days, more on days than they do off days next year. You'd think that they could be better than most of those teams, especially with the St James's Park factor and the kind of you know a good manager as well. Um, the problem comes when they play the top six, and I don't think they're they're at that level yet. The top four are still you know miles away. The top two are. Are going to the top two are going to be the top two next year as well, probably in the same order, I would think. And then there will be, I think, Chelsea third. I think you know, Manchester United possibly are there to be got at with, with the transition that's going on there. But that, that to me is the thing that stops me from saying Newcastle are going to be top six because I, I just where are you going to get in? Where are you going to get in to that top six? As I said, maybe you could look at, you know, you, you could look at your kind of your, your West Ham, Manchester United. Could Newcastle be better than West Ham, better than Manchester United? I think with two, with a couple of forward signings, they can. But it's a, it's asking a lot to jump from where they are now to, to there. So I think eighth would be a decent, a decent, um, a decent return. The cups are going to be key, aren't they? I think they're going to go for the cups next year, and there's going to be an, an emphasis on it. I think uh, cue them probably getting Man City in the uh, third round of the FA Cup, and you know Liverpool in the uh, third round or second round of the uh, third round of the uh, the League Cup as well, which is what always happens, isn't it? But but I'd love to see them go go for that, and I'd love to see them get into the mix for the Europa League next year as well. Um, but that'll depend on you know what they do for the rest of this transfer window, and then maybe what they do in January as well, because if they're sixth or seventh in January and then they sort of they may you know knowing what we know about this ownership group they may decide right we're, we're going to go for it we're going to we're going to go and get go out and get a truly outstanding player because we feel that we can maybe push on to fourth but I think eighth is fine in five years time it's really it's really interesting because I think we're going to have to see a team fall away for Newcastle to get into to get into that fourth that fourth slot I think's there it is there for 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 them to take, you know, because you look at you look at the teams at the moment. Spurs are having a good summer, so they're trying to consolidate being fourth. Arsenal are kind of obviously going to try and spend a bit of money as well. I think Chelsea, you know, the ownership group gives you an opportunity to kind of get in there as well. Newcastle are only going to get better. I think Newcastle are just going to keep progressing. They're going to get better and better and better um, because they're going to do the right things because they've got Dan Ashworth, they've got a good manager um, and they're going to keep buying good players. But it's whether they can get good enough, quick enough to be in the top four in the, in the next five years. But I think they'll be, they'll be there or thereabouts. I'm convinced of that. And, you know, 
I would think that by the next in the next five years they'll have they'll have they'll have had a chance to win something. Whether you know, I don't want to sit here and say they're going to win something because you know it's just you just never know. But but I, I think they'll be close. They'll have come close if not have won a trophy by then as well. And they'll be they'll have played a few times in Europe as well. So um, so something to look forward to. I think we, we just know next season is not going to be a relegation fight. Off the, mm. off the bat, you know, if it is a relegation fight, then they've done something, you know, something really has gone badly wrong. But I just don't think it's going to be that way. I think they're going to be starting the season looking up as opposed to looking looking where they were looking last season, which was to get out of the bottom two, bottom three. Yeah, last season was the first season I can remember for ages that I just didn't want it to end. Mm. And yeah. like now, now this is the first season for a good few years where again we're looking up and not behind us. Yeah, and and just terrified of what another year of not I getting was saying that. On loan. Totally, I was saying that to a few, to a couple of couple of guys there who I know Newcastle fans saying it's the first summer I can remember I actually want the season to start because I kind of like yeah. you know the last few years you know you, you, it kind of comes around and you're like oh yeah it's come back and but you knew there were so many like. You know, you couldn't really be positive about who they'd signed because they only signed Joe Willick or they'd only signed, you know, I think the previous year they'd signed players who, you know, yeah, you were quite interested in them. But the problem with Newcastle and their Ashley was whatever they did well, you knew they weren't going to build on it. And you knew that if they did do something good, the chances were Ashley was going to do something that was going to undermine yeah. it all anyway. Yeah, there this was time, always something around the corner to kick you in the nuts always. whenever you thought something was going well. Always. I mean, that was the Rafa thing, wasn't it? It was like you couldn't enjoy Rafa being here because you knew that, you know, they had one summer where after they got they came out of the chat where they got sorry, came down into the championship and they actually did do something. But even then in January, we had the sort of like, oh, he doesn't want to sign Andrews Towns, and it was all that, and you just had that. Bruce was just terrible because you knew that it was nothing was going to change. And what's great about this summer is they finished the season well and they've gone out and signed two players who really improved them already and they're going to sign more players and they're going to keep building. And you're not going to have a situation where you're, you know, we're going to be tweeting something in two weeks' time saying, you know, Eddie Howe on the brink of being sacked because they're going to get some fella who's, you know, nobody wants in, you know, a Steve Bruce, basically, you know, Steve Bruce type. So I'm looking forward to it. I mean, that 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 is the biggest thing this year, that they finished the season and you didn't want it to end. And you can't wait for that first day against Nottingham Forest because that will be, that will be, you know, electric, um, amazing sort of atmosphere in the ground. I think Forest are going to bring full capacity and they'll be actually bang up for it. And Newcastle will, will be, desperate to uh, to start well and I think that'll be fantastic and and, and I can't wait you know I and mean, it's you know it's 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 still a month away and I, and I just want it to start to start tomorrow and I'm I've not been like that about a Newcastle United season for for a long time I think probably since the Rafa promotion season was the last time I thought oh, I can't wait for it to start because I think that you know they've got a chance this year this is the first time for ages so yeah it's uh, long may it continue yeah, very much so. Hopefully it's a good season for Newcastle and even a good season for Bradford City if they can get out of League 2 at League 1. Yeah. That's a good season yeah. all round, isn't it now? Yeah, well, that, that's been the worst thing about the last two years is Bradford have been absolutely terrible as well. But they, they seem to, you know, they seem to have had a they seem to have had a go this season in the transfer market relatively. And you know, Mark Hughes, it's funny, you know, because Mark Hughes obviously he was linked with the, the Newcastle job a few times, yeah. wasn't he? And I think Newcastle fans were all kind of like, oh God, don't bring somebody like Mark Hughes in. He's gone into Bradford. I mean, I, I you know, couldn't be happier with him. He's so it's just way out of our level. And um, speaking to him, I actually went down to do a one-to-one with him and he was really impressive guy, really nice guy as well. Um, and I think what he actually said was, it's nice to come into a club where they want you in, <laughs> they want you to be there. Yeah. <laughs> it must be horrible to go into a club. And, you know, Bruce, it must have been horrible for him to go into a club and know that nobody wanted him there. And they've got these kind of egos where they're like, you know, I feel I can go in and change it, but it can't be very nice. And it's great for, great for Mark Hughes. And if he takes us up, I think, you know, we can go through the leagues a little bit and maybe try and get ourselves into the championship, which is, I think top end of our ambitions. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'm, you know, that's only that's only three weeks away. So um yeah, I can't wait, can't wait for our season to start and uh, can't wait for Newcastle to start. Um hopefully it'll be a kind of good season for for Newcastle and a promotion for City. Well, hopefully on your sake for Bradford and hopefully for our sake for Newcastle United, it should be a fantastic season all around. But Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure. 
having you on the Green and Mullins show. It's been really, really fascinating talking to you about all things transfers and the future of Newcastle United and the fact it's going to be amazing. It just seems nailed on that. That's the way it's going to be from now on. But it's been brilliant having you on. Sam, where can everybody listen to this podcast? Links are in the description. The audio podcasts are out every Tuesday. If you're listening on Apple, please hit the five-star review. And if you're just tuning in, uh, Mark has all but confirmed. Brozier is signed. It's a done deal. TK is agent just an absolute knob. And, yeah, no, I'm joking, of course. But, uh, yeah, fingers crossed there's uh, there's plenty of activity to keep you busy in the next few weeks, Mark, before the window closes. Yeah, no, hopefully. I think I think we'll, I think we'll have a little flurry, and I think transfer deadline week is going to be interesting as well. So um, long may it continue. Yeah, big thanks to Mark again. But for myself, Jonathan Green and Sam Mulliner, and our guest, Mark Douglas, 